let me say, a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. What a joy it is to be here with all of you and to also hear the speakers and just to draw on the graces of this day. I really want to extend my thanks not only to Jason and to Rob Palladino for shepherding this, but especially to our shepherd, Bishop Saratelli, for coming here and sharing his own wisdom and experience, and uh, Dr. Dennis McNamara as well as uh, Adam. What a fine presentation you gave. I, uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm really in awe of what our Lord is doing, not only in the day, but in this season of the church's life. I'd like to begin our time together in a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for forming us to be part of your earthly family. But even more, we thank you that this family not only reaches around the world, but it stretches from earth to heaven. That there aren't two families, nor are there two churches. There is one, because there is one liturgy, one covenant that unites us to the angels and saints. It unites us to your own inner life, to the divine love of the eternal trinity. Abba Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you now for the gift of the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds with the light of truth, but also to enkindle our hearts with the fire of your divine and passionate love, to empower us to not only learn, but to live out all that we learn and to share it in justice and with mercy. Help us then and hear us as we pray the family prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Francis of Assisi, St. Teresa of Avila, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My presentation this afternoon is entitled, Paschal Sacrifice, a Heavenly Banquet for Earthly Beggars. And so I want to strike a balance between the celestial and the terrestrial, but between the divine mystery and our own human experience, which sometimes lags behind all of that which is sacred in our midst. As many of you might know, Ukrainian Christians love to tell the story of how their ancestors discovered the Eucharistic liturgy. It was the year 988 that Prince Vladimir in Kiev was seeking to unite his kingdom, and he sent emissaries out to various centers, to various cities, including one group that went to Byzantium, Constantinople. And they entered Hagia Sophia, and they experienced the liturgy of the Holy Eucharist in that wondrous context. And of course, they came back and reported to the prince, we did not know whether we were in heaven or on earth, Never have we seen such beauty. We cannot describe it, but this much we can say, there God dwells among mankind. And of course, we have the baptism and the conversion and the subsequent enculturation of the gospel there in the Ukraine and throughout Russia. Well, that was over a thousand years ago. Just about 25 years ago, I had an experience myself. I was still a Protestant because it was this year I'm celebrating my anniversary, my quarter of a century, 25 years in the church, but it was a couple of months before Easter when I was finally driven crazy enough by curiosity to attend for the first time a Mass. I'd never been to one before, I'd never wanted to go, but 
I was studying the early fathers and reading Hippolytus, the Didascale, the Apostolic Constitutions and these doctoral seminars, wondering what, if any, residue remains of the ancient liturgy in your Mass. And so I wasn't sure exactly when or where to go until I heard that I actually read in the campus bulletin about this noonday Mass in a basement chapel on a weekday, which sounded so safe that I just snuck away and went down there. And I sat in the back, and I just witnessed, like a journalist or an observer, the Eucharistic liturgy unfold. And I won't go into the details. I've done that before in books and so on. But what struck me right off the bat was what an amazing match, what a correspondence between what I'd just been reading from the second century in St. Justin Martyr to what we had in the entrance anaphon and the opening rite and the penitential rite, and then the reading of the Scriptures first from the old and then the new, and then the prayer of the faithful. It was like a checklist from the first and second centuries. But what really struck me was the shift from the synaxis as I knew it, the liturgy of the Word as you probably knew it, to the liturgy of the Eucharist. As all the action shifted away from the, the ambo to the altar, I listened for the first time to the Eucharistic preface and the anaphora and all of that. And as I caught the paschal overtones of the ancient Jewish liturgy, as well as the apostolic tradition, I then was struck immediately by the words of consecration which I'd heard for the very first time. When that priest pronounced the words of consecration, it was like my heart was suddenly transfixed. This is my body which, was, which will be given up for you. And that's when I knew, by a grace that I didn't see coming and I didn't deserve, it was no longer bread. Whatever term I might have used, I knew that I knew that I knew it was Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. By the time he was done consecrating the chalice, I found myself in that back pew literally drooling for holy thirst of this precious blood as well as his, his body. And as the people all around me suddenly stood up and began chanting as if on cue, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. They said it a second time and then a third time and dropped to their knees. And that priest lifted up the host and said a fourth time, Behold the Lamb of God. And that's when the light came on for me because it was not just the real presence of Christ. It was the truth and the reality of a book in the Bible that I'd been studying for years, the Apocalypse. When I heard the Lamb of God four times in less than a couple of minutes, I watched as the people went forward to receive, but I was turning into the back of my Bible to look and find the, the many places where Jesus is called the Lamb of God there, using the technical term from the liturgy that no other New Testament book employs to describe Jesus. Jesus is called the Lamb of God 28 times in 22 chapters in the Apocalypse, and nobody had ever been able to explain to me why is that the primary title. So I'm looking down and seeing the Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God, but I'm also looking down and seeing the holy, holy, holy in Revelation 4, verse 8. And as the people are coming back from receiving communion, I'm looking down and I'm also seeing the Alleluia, which was the liturgical acclamation from the temple worship. I'm also seeing that Jesus is wearing a white liturgical vestment. There are candles, there's an altar. And I begin to notice all sorts of things on the pages that I had never noticed before. I never been to Mass. By the time it was quiet, and then after the words of benediction, and they were dismissed, I was left alone, sitting in the back pew, somewhat stunned, trying to figure out where I'd been. Did I go downstairs for a basement chapel and a weekday Mass, or was I whisked up to the heavenly Jerusalem for the liturgy of the angels and saints, and somehow, clearly, both were true? I had gone to Mass, and yet I'd gone to heaven. And I stuck around for nearly an hour, not knowing what to do, except to pray and to give thanks. I spent the rest of that afternoon in the library, taking out sources. After dinner, we got our kids down, and I spent the rest of the evening looking through the book of Revelation, which I had not only read many times, but I had translated in its entirety as my senior Greek seminar project back in college. I had figured out way back then that this book is not it's not concerned with the Antichrist 
or the rapture or the second coming, words and phrases that aren't even found a single time in the entire book, but I didn't know positively what it was about until that night when I began rereading it from beginning to end, from stem to stern. It just struck me that the one thing you find on every page of the apocalypse is the liturgy. In the first two or three verses, you have the first of seven liturgical benedictions. And then you discover all the visions are given in verse 10, when he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, which was the liturgical day of worship in the new, what the Sabbath was in the old. And as you continue reading, you find, as I describe in my book, The Lamb's Supper, that there is an altar in heaven. There are candles, incense, chalices, canticles, acclamations, the sanctus, the gloria, the alleluia. There are trumpets. This is why I discovered later that in the Eastern tradition among the fathers, the book of Revelation was characterized as, quote, an icon of the liturgy. And as I was reading it that evening, I didn't finish until it was nearly 3 a.m. And by the time I was halfway through, I began to notice a very enlightening pattern, a twofold structure to the book of Revelation that I knew from years of research corresponded to the twofold structure of the Mass that I had witnessed for the first time. In the first 11 or 12 chapters of the Apocalypse, all the action revolves around a scroll. In the Greek, the term is biblion, where we get the word Bible. It's unsealed and opened and proclaimed as having been fulfilled precisely by the Lamb. And we see a vision of that fulfillment at the centerpiece in Revelation 12. But that's where all the action shifts, away from the liturgy of the Word in heaven to an altar where Jesus now stands wearing that cotone, that liturgical vestment, and he described, John describes how there are seven chalices that contain wine, but when they're poured out, they've become blood. At the end of this, the end of which, the angel invites all of the faithful in Revelation 19, verse 9, to come to what? The wedding supper of the Lamb, the wedding banquet of the Lamb. And that marriage supper was where I had been earlier that day. And so the next day I was back. In fact, for the next two weeks, I was sneaking down those steps and participating in the heavenly liturgy down in a basement chapel, experiencing heaven on earth. And after doing that for several weeks and a couple of months, I was a goner. I was received into the church Easter vigil, vigil, as I said, a quarter of a century ago. But I want to recount another experience because something happened to me about 15 years ago here in Steubenville. I have six kids, five sons, one daughter, or as I say, one thorn, I'm sorry, one rose and five thorns. <laughs> and it was when my daughter was barely five years old, she had heard me give a talk on campus going through the book of Revelation, describing the chalices, the candles, the vestments, the book, and all of these liturgical songs and prayers and acclamations climaxing with this declaration that somehow when we are in the Mass, heaven comes to earth. That we don't have to die to go to heaven. All we've got to do as Catholics is go to Mass and heaven is where we are. And that's where I ended the talk. A few days later, I had forgotten about it, but apparently she hadn't because she came to me at the ripe, old, and mature age of I think five and a half or so, and she said, Daddy, I don't think I want to go to heaven. <laughs> What? <laughs> what are the alternatives? <laughs> you know? And she said, I don't know, and I didn't want to scare her, so I just asked her, why not? And she said, because if what you say is true, then I'm going to be really bored. Because, you know, if, if, if heaven is just like the mass and it lasts forever, it's already too long. <laughs> You know, and I went in search of an answer, which I didn't find right away. I just tried my best as her daddy to explain that when we're there, you know, things are going to be different. We're going to see a glorious and spectacular beauty that will make thousands of years go by like a few minutes. And I could see her trying to extend to her daddy a line of credit. <laughs> it was very difficult, you know. But I'll be honest, I've gone back and I have thought about that many times because I'm looking now at the new translation and I realize that a balance is being struck throughout, perhaps more than it was in my experience 25 years ago. 
The thing that I'm perhaps most happy about in this new translation that we'll all be experiencing starting next month is what we are going to hear near the very end and at the climax of the Mass. Instead of happy are those who are called to the supper, which always struck me a little bit like it's dinner time. <laughs> we now hear blessed are those who are called. Blessed. You can be blessed whether you're happy or sad because the blessings are what flow from the covenant that God has established, which he renews through us, with us through the sacraments. You see, the sacraments, as Adam mentioned, are not primarily what we do for God so much as they are what God is primarily doing for us as he's fathering us through Christ the high priest and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Really a direct quotation from Revelation 19.9, the climax of John's visions and the climax of our liturgy, where we as the bride are united to the groom by the sacrifice and by this holy communion as Dr. Bergsma described it so magnificently earlier today. This is the reality whether we know it or not. This was the reality whether I believed it or not. And by disbelieving it, I didn't make it unreal. By coming to recognize it, it didn't make it any more real. It just made it a whole lot more meaningful and powerful in my own life and my personal experience. And so I'm grateful to hear this change, which really, which really concurs with the Latin and with most all of the other European language translations since the 60s and the 70s. Because as I said, it captures that one side of the divine mystery of the heavenly liturgy where we share the songs, the prayers, and the sacrifice of the Lamb alongside of the angels and the saints and the mother of God, the woman of Revelation 12, as we are surrounded and enveloped in this mystery. But there's another aspect to this translation which we are also going to become familiar with, which I think is going to help strike the balance. And that is the words of Matthew 8, verse 8, where we are going to be practically quoting the Roman centurion, who said what? Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant shall be healed. At that moment, I think we need to reflect upon the other side of the mystery, because we are going to be saying what? Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. What are we doing? Two things simultaneously. On the one hand, we are going to be identifying ourselves with the humility of that Roman centurion, as well as his great trust in Christ and his authority to do what I am asking from a distance. Such humility, such trust startled Jesus, who says, I have not found such faith in all of Israel. And here was one of the Roman occupation soldiers, a leader, who knew that he was not only an outsider, but an unwelcomed one. And yet he could also see that Christ, like him, was under authority, his father's, but he was also someone who exercised that authority. But not only do we identify ourselves with the centurion's humility, because he's not worthy, but also his trust, but we identify ourselves with his servant. Because we basically say, what? Our soul shall be healed, which implies that our soul is sick, like that centurion's servant was. So while we exercise that trust and the humility of the centurion, we also recognize our own condition and need. And I think this is what helps us to understand how it can be a heavenly banquet, and yet how we as earthly beggars come with such great need. Lord, I am not worthy, but I sure am needy. And it's on the basis of our own need and our humble recognition of that, that God the Father longs to feed us with his Son through the power of the Spirit much more than all of us long to be fed put together. And this is the plain and simple gospel truth for us as Catholics. Now, I've already covered some of the texts from the Apocalypse, at least quickly by way of illusion, concerning the Lamb of God the holy, 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 the amen, the alleluia, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the book that is opened and unsealed and proclaimed and fulfilled, the altar up there with seven chalices containing wine poured out, they've become blood, and how it is we are united 
as we renew our covenant with our groom as the bride and in a life-giving way. I'd like to shift from the visions of John in the apocalypse, and I want to move backwards to the Gospel of Luke. I want to look first at Luke 22, but I also want to consider Luke 14. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Luke 22, which we will consider briefly. I realize that most of you are cradle Catholics, <laughs> so that's why we're not hearing the rustling of many pages. But we all know that, I, please pardon a little convert humor, even, even after a quarter century, it still is somewhat irrepressible. We have in Luke 22 the fullest account of the institution of the Eucharist in the synoptic tradition. Matthew and Mark give us an institution narrative, but Luke's is longer and fuller than Matthew and Mark combined. But Luke gives us even more than just a fuller institution narrative, because what Luke provides us throughout his gospel is what has been described as banquet theology. Because in Luke's gospel, there are 10 dis distinct, discrete meal scenes, seven of them before the Eucharist, two of them after. And it's not just accidental or arbitrary. It is deliberate. It is strategic. It is cumulative. We're going to be considering one of the earlier meal scenes after I briefly consider the Eucharistic institution. But there are seven leading up to the Eucharist. The first and the seventh are with tax collectors, Levi and Zacchaeus. The second and the sixth are with Pharisees who should have learned their lesson and maybe thought twice about inviting Jesus. But the eighth, following the seven, that is the Eucharistic institution. And then the ninth and the tenth both occur in Luke 24 and are related directly to what is described in Luke 22. The first of those last two, number nine, is, of course, what takes place in the village of Emmaus, when Clopas and his companion have been walking with this apparent stranger for hours on the road that leads from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And what was he doing? He was opening up the scriptures, beginning with Moses and then all of the prophets, explaining to them the things concerning himself and why it was necessary for the Christ to suffer these things before entering into his glory. And later, when they look back on those hours, how did they characterize their experience? Did not our hearts burn within us as he opened up the scriptures? But while their hearts were burning, their eyes were still shut. So what had to happen? Well, in this ninth meal scene, we read in verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he did something. He actually does four things. There are four verbs. He took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them the exact same four verbs in the same sequence that you find in Luke 22 where the Eucharist was instituted, except Clopas and his companion weren't numbered among the 12. And so it wasn't just a case of reminiscence. It was a case of divine revelation. Because when he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them, their eyes were suddenly opened and they recognized him. And just as suddenly he vanished out of their sight. Why did he do that? Was he playing, you know, now you see me, you know? Once their faith had reached the point where it grasped the mystery of his real presence in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread, his physical body, his visible presence were no longer needed. If anything, it might have posed an obstacle or an impediment to faith maturing. But it was after he took, blessed, broke, and gave it to them that their eyes were opened, and then he vanished, and they finally acknowledge how their hearts had been burning within them, and yet they only recognized them how in the breaking of the bread. They got up that hour, walked all the way back, and recounted to the eleven what had happened. This, of course, becomes a paradigm for the early church, because, of course, we know that Luke wrote a sequel, and in his sequel, the book of Acts, breaking the bread becomes practically idiomatic for what we would call the Mass in Acts 2.42 and Acts 20, verse 6 and 7, as well as in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. And so Luke's banquet theology is clearly something that is carefully orchestrated. 
It is a kind of cumulative and symphonic presentation. The seven that prepare for number eight, and then this ninth, and then of course the next one, because he appears once again on the Lord's Day to his apostles in the context of a meal, setting a pattern, and at the same time establishing belief that on the Lord's Day, when we gather to break the bread, it's more than a meal, it's the Passover of the new covenant, and if it's the true Passover, it's a sacrifice first and then a meal second. So there in Luke 22, where we really have the hinge in which all of these meals turn, away from the ordinary meals and banquets to the sacrament and then to the real presence of the Eucharistic Lord, we have something of decisive significance, especially for us as Catholics. And I just want to relate something that's been happening in the last three or four months. I've had a, a friendship rekindled that goes back to the 70s, a classmate named Chris. We went to high school and graduated in 75. He was the valedictorian. He was also, uh, you know, a regular mass-going Catholic. And so in the cafeteria, I don't remember this, but he basically swears that this happened frequently. I would sit down, and after small talk, I would launch into a sort of, you know, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? And, you know, he, he recounted this to me recently because, oh, about eight years ago, we saw each other for the first time in decades at an airport. And he's like, oh, Scott, you'll be happy to know that I'm an evangelical Bible Christian. <laughs> and I said, Chris, I'm not sure whether you'll be happy or not to know that I'm an evangelical Bible Catholic. He was beyond startled, so we had to sit down, and in about 10 minutes, I had to kind of spill the beans. I had to get out as much as I could, and then, of course, we just exchanged business cards and started calling each other irregularly at that point. Well, to make a long story short, I basically shared with him what the Father shared with me, along with this other theologian who I began to study carefully. His name is Ratzinger. Perhaps you've heard of him. <laughs> About 27 years ago, I began devouring this man's work, and it really struck me as being so similar to what I had been reading in the Fathers. Ratzinger makes a point that for me proved to be decisive, that this idea, you know, where do you find in the New Testament the sacrifice of the Mass? You know, non-Catholics would not point to the Mass as the sacrifice, but to what? Calvary. Calvary's the sacrifice. And would we disagree? Of course not. Calvary is not only a sacrifice, but the supreme sacrifice of all times. But Ratzinger was the one who stated the obvious that I had never seen before when he pointed out that nobody standing at Calvary on that day, Good Friday, would have gone home and de described their experience in terms of a sacrifice. Why not? Because it took place outside the walls. It took place far from the temple where there were no altars, there were no priests dressed in vestments, there was no sacrifice. What they would have gone home and recounted would have been nothing more than a Roman execution, plain and simple, in great brutality, too. So the question became for me, and then for Chris, how does a Roman execution suddenly get transformed into a sacrifice that all Christians agree on, and the supreme sacrifice that retires all the animal offerings to boot? And I pressed Chris the same way Ratzinger had pressed me, because it's not something that is easily answered, especially when we remember that most all of the early believers were Jewish Christians who simply lacked the categories to translate a Roman execution into the supreme sacrifice. And I pointed out to him again what Ratzinger had shown me, namely that it had happened very early through the work of the Holy Spirit and the teaching of the apostles, as we find, for instance, perhaps earliest of all, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, what does Paul announce? Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. And in the subsequent chapters, 6 through 11, he goes on to describe that feast in terms that we recognize as the Holy Eucharist, especially by the time he gets to chapter 11. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed is what really opened my eyes to see that the only way the early church could interpret an execution 
as a sacrifice on Good Friday was by rewinding the tape, by taking a giant step and looking at what happened on Friday in the light of what Jesus did on Thursday. What was he doing in the upper room with his disciples on Holy Thursday? He was celebrating the Passover of the Old Covenant one last time, but that's not all he was doing. He was fulfilling, fulfilling it as the Lamb. But he wasn't just fulfilling it as the Lamb of God set to retire the Passover. He was transforming the Old into the New. The Passover of ancient Israel became the Eucharist of the New Covenant. And so the disciples in the midst of this familiar liturgy which they had experienced since childhood suddenly hear something strange, sort of out of the rubrics. What did he say? This is my body which will be given for you? Is that written down anywhere? No, he just added it. This is my body which will be given up for you. What kind of rhetorical insertion is that? And near the end of the meal, they heard something else, and that is, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Could be translated New Testament, kinda diatheke, and the Greek can go either way. The blood of the new covenant, the New Testament, poured out for many for the remission of sins, do this in remembrance of me. And again, they must have been scratching their heads wondering, what is he talking about? What is he doing? What is this new rhetoric, this additional ritual? And I suspect they were wondering even as they left that night and walked with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't think they realized what he was really saying or doing even the next day. Only with the illuminating grace of the Holy Spirit did they realize later on he wasn't just adding a little bit of rhetoric or ritual. He said what he meant, he meant what he said. This is my body which will be given up for you. That's how he was fulfilling the Passover of the old, as the true lamb. That's how he was transforming it into the Passover of the new by instituting the Eucharist. And so when he says, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the new testament, that chalice contained wine no longer. It contained Christ himself. And so with the help of the Holy Spirit, these early believers realized that the Eucharist is what transformed Good Friday from being a mere execution to becoming the culmination and climax of what? The new Passover. And I can tell you this much. If the first Mass wasn't a sacrifice, then Calvary is only an execution. Only if the first Mass was a sacrifice can we understand the belief of the first generation that transformed an execution into the supreme sacrifice that fulfilled all previous animal offerings? The Eucharist is what transforms Calvary into the sacrifice. It's inseparably one and the same self-offering. And just as Holy Thursday transformed Good Friday from being a brutal execution to a divine sacrifice, I want to propose that Easter Sunday is precisely what transformed that sacrifice into a sacrament, something that the apostles with the power of the Holy Spirit could do in remembrance of him, because that's who is really present in the Mass. It isn't the battered body of Jesus' corpse hanging on the cross, gasping for air, and then finally dying. It's one and the same sacrifice, and it's the same body, only it is the resurrected body of Christ. It is the ascended body. It is the glorified, deified, sacred humanity of Christ that is present in our tabernacles, on our altars, on our tongues, whenever we receive this heavenly Passover, this paschal sacrifice. Precisely because it's a, sa a Passover, we don't have to figure out, well, is it a sacrifice or is it a meal? Because what was the Passover in the old as well as the new? It was a meal, but only a meal second. It was a sacrifice first and foremost, which was ordered to the sacrificial communion of the Passover meal. And so Luke 22, in giving us the institution of the Holy Eucharist, is what illuminates the mystery of the cross, showing us that Jesus wasn't simply the victim of Roman injustice and violence. He was the victim of divine love. 
He didn't lose his life on Friday if, in fact, he gave it to them and us on Thursday. And he did. Or as St. Thomas Aquinas would say, it isn't how much he suffered on the cross that saves us. Rather, it's how much he loved. Because suffering in itself doesn't save, it doesn't satisfy divine justice. But love by itself is not enough either. To paraphrase again Pope Benedict, suffering without love is unendurable. But love without suffering is mere words or feelings. How do you express love? How do you prove true love? How do you perfect and purify love? Through suffering. And what does love do to suffering? It transforms it into a sacrifice. The offering of Christ, the self-sacrificial offering in the Holy Eucharist that Luke describes in chapter 22 is precisely what transforms the brutality and the violence of Jesus' own personal suffering on Good Friday into the holiest sacrifice of all. But not one that he offers so that we don't have to, but precisely one that he offers so we can. By receiving the Holy Eucharist in love, we can offer up our meager sufferings and unite them to Christ's redemptive sacrifice. As some of you who are cradle Catholics have told me over the years, you know, if you stubbed your toe or if you missed the bus, you know, what was the refrain in the domestic liturgy from your mom? Offer it up. <laughs> and it isn't just, you know, pietistic rhetoric. It is a Eucharistic mystery because the love that we receive becomes our own. The sufferings that we endure can be transformed by that love into a holy sacrifice. And in the process, we now have a capacity not to win arguments with non-Catholics, but to win brothers and sisters in Christ, to show them that not only is the Eucharist necessarily a sacrifice, or else Calvary is just an execution. But I also want to throw this in at no extra charge. <laughs> the next time somebody says, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass, ask them what they mean by the New Testament. And of course, they'll point to the book, the 27 documents that are forming the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. But then ask them, if we're really going to follow the New Testament, where does the New Testament ever call itself the New Testament? And the short answer is it doesn't. Nowhere does it. But the New Testament does, in fact, employ that phrase, the New Testament, or New Covenant, and where? Well, as I mentioned, in Luke 22, verses 18 through 20 as well as in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 20, verse 20 and following. And, and what do you find there? This is the chalice. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the New Testament. And what does he say? Write this in remembrance of me. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Well, he says, read this and remember. No, he doesn't say that. He, well, exegete this and preach that. No, he says, do this. Do what? The Eucharist. And what is the Eucharist? The New Testament. The New Covenant. At least according to the New Testament. <laughs> according to the New Testament, the New Testament is a sacrament. Long before it ever started to become a document. According to the document. And so, what did they do after the Paschal mystery? They went out proclaiming the word, baptizing new believers, and as we read in Acts 2.42, breaking the bread, celebrating the Eucharistic liturgy. Why? Because they were commanded to do this in remembrance, and the this was the New Testament, the New Covenant, and wherever the church spread and boy did it spread. They were doing this, though they weren't necessarily writing. In fact, over half of the 12 never contributed a single book to the collection we call the New Testament, not because they were unfaithful or disobedient, but because Christ had not commanded them to write the New Testament, but to do it. Christ never wrote a thing. He never commanded them to write anything. Don't get me wrong. I am more grateful for the New Testament document now as a Catholic than I was when it was all sola scriptura. But when you subordinate the New Testament document to the Eucharistic sacrament, 
You don't devalue the sacred Scripture. You revalue and reinvigorate it, and you empower that book to illuminate the mystery that it was written to prepare people to celebrate. In fact, within about 10 or 20 years, the New Testament books were, were begun, but they weren't completed until the end of the first century. One of the earliest records that historians can find, where did people, when did people first start be begin calling these books the New Testament? It isn't until the end of the second century. In the second half of the second century are the earliest references to people calling this book the New Testament. Why did they begin calling this book the New Testament? or these books that they were gathering? Well, historians tell us because of the liturgical proximity of those books to the Eucharist. The Eucharist was the new covenant, the New Testament, in the first half of the first century and from there on. But because these were the books that were written by the apostles to be read in preparation for the celebration of the Holy Eucharist, and since the Eucharist is the new covenant, then it would be natural to call these books the new covenant because these were the ones that were brought out and read in preparation for the new Passover, the Eucharist, the new covenant. Isn't it ironic that these people who embrace sola scriptura like I once did refer to the New Testament, though the New Testament never calls itself the New Testament, they're just simply echoing our living tradition. How ironic is that? But it's an opportunity for us, again, not to win arguments, but brothers and sisters. In my case, it's also an opportunity to win back a daughter. Because I want to look now in the closing moments at something that you find in Luke 14. In Luke 14, as I mentioned, you find something that we read in the church's liturgy. In fact, it was read just a few weeks after my daughter came to me and told me she didn't want to go to heaven. And I was still kind of puzzling over how to respond to that sort of unexpected statement. You now, when she said, the, the Mass, it, it seems so long, and I'll be honest, Daddy, I'm bored. And I didn't have enough humility to admit that sometimes it seemed long to me. <laughs> and sometimes I found myself bored and distracted. You know, I, I, I quoted St. Jose Maria one evening to her. I said, listen to this, the Mass seems long because our love is short. And she's like, that's nice, Daddy. You know, <laughs> It certainly didn't scratch where she itched, though, you know? But I, I remember one Sunday at St. Pete's downtown hearing the reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, all about this meal number six. One Sabbath when he went to dine at the house of a ruler belonged to the Pharisees, they were watching him. Why? Because there was a man with dropsy. Edema, you know. What are they going to do? It's the Sabbath. And so he goes ahead and heals. And they're kind of bugged by that. And so he replies, which of you having a son or an ox that's fallen into a well will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could not reply to him. And then he quickly follows it up with a parable. No, with a second parable. No, with a third parable. Right after this encounter at the Pharisee's house where he was hosting a banquet where Jesus was invited, Jesus follows up that tense encounter with what some scholars call a parabolic triple play. Three parables, back to back. And we all know them, but what I want you to notice is the context. Because they not only come right on the heels of this meal, number six, but right before the meal, we had just heard Jesus talk about how people are going to come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. So beginning in verse 7, he told them a parable to those who were invited. So he turns to all the invitees and he said to them, when you're invited by anyone to a marriage feast, don't sit down in a place of honor, lest a more eminent man than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you'll begin to be shamed to take the lower place. When you're invited, go and sit at the lowest place. Then you might hear the master of ceremony say, friend, go up higher. And the point is not sit in a lower seat so everybody gets to see you promoted. The point is rather, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. 
So at the conclusion of the first of the three parables, he's telling all of the invitees that when you go to a marriage feast, take the lowest seat because only if you humble yourself will you be exalted. And they must have been scratching their heads. You know, why does this guy have a marriage feast, you know, on his, on his brain? I mean, this is a, a Sabbath banquet. A marriage feast? What a, a strange thing to say. But it's clear throughout the Gospels Jesus is frequently revealing the fact that he's got a marriage supper on his mind. And so he talks about what to do when you're invited to a marriage supper, a marriage feast. Humble yourself so that you'll be exalted. And then he follows it up with a second parable. After having insulted all of the invitees who had been jockeying for position of honor there, he turned to the man who invited him. So having, you know, basically put the invitees in their place, he now turns to the host. When you give a dinner or a banquet, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your kinsmen or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. At that point, it must have gotten really awkward because, you know, you're looking around the room and who basically do you see? You see his friends, his brothers, his kinsmen, and rich neighbors. And why? because he wants to be repaid. How tense, how awkward, how untimely, Lord. Instead, when you, he's talking now to the host, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And you will be blessed because they can't repay you. And I'm thinking to myself as I'm hearing this read, how impractical is that? Okay, you're not going to necessarily invite all your friends and brothers and rich neighbors to be repaid. You might just kind of go a little lower on the social ladder, invite them. But what would it even look like if you were to invite the maimed and the lame and the blind and the poor? I mean, the blind are sitting there at the banquet and they can't even see the food, much less know where to pick up the utensils. And, you know, and the maimed, they can see it, but they can't grab it because they're crippled. Jesus, you know, get real. <laughs> and at this point, having turned on the guests and then having turned on the host, in verse 15, when one of those sat at table with him heard this, he said, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Because Jews associated the kingdom of God with eating bread. In other words, let's find some common ground. Let's just settle down, you know, let's just <laughs> detox, you know. What do we all agree on? Blessed is the one who eats bread in the kingdom. We can agree on that, right? Wrong. <laughs> this time Jesus turns on him. <laughs> he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet. And then of course he recounts what we read in Matthew 22, all about a marriage feast hosted by a king for his son. Sound familiar? And so all the invitations are sent and all the excuses come back. So at the end of this third parable in the triple play, what does the king, what does the master end up deciding upon? Go to the highways and the byways and bring in the poor, maimed, blind, and lame. The exact same four words in the exact same sequence in parable three that you find in parable number two. And so the servants go out and do just that. So that my house may be full. And I'll be honest, when I heard this gospel and I was looking down at it in the context of the Sunday Mass, I tuned out of the homily because I felt like our Lord was tuning into me and to my daughter. Because suddenly I could realize, okay, Luke has described all of these meals to kind of present a banquet theology to prepare for the Eucharist. And how it is that the resurrected Lord makes himself known after his death and resurrection, precisely in the context of meals on the Lord's Day in Luke 24. But after the banquet and the healing, the first of the three parables is where Jesus says, if you're invited to a marriage feast, and it occurred to me, that would be me, I'm here Sunday morning to celebrate the Eucharistic liturgy with the people of God. If I'm invited to a marriage feast, what should I do? Humble myself so I should be exalted. 
if I exalt myself, I'll be humbled. If I humble myself, I'll be exalted. Okay, but what form does that take? How do we go about humbling ourselves? Well, funny you would ask, Scott, because look at the second parable. Because I'm not like the Pharisee hosting all of my rich friends who will repay me. I'm like the man that Jesus was talking about. And so who have I invited? The poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And what has he invited them to? The marriage feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the heavenly liturgy where the angels and the saints and all of us faithful gather around the altar to celebrate what the angels and saints see, but for us, it looks like bread and it tastes like wine. I remember what Cardinal Wright of my native town of Pittsburgh once said when he heard people saying, the Eucharist isn't a sacrifice, it's just a meal. He was over 300 pounds. He said, a meal, it's not even a snack. <laughs> <laughs> but as I was pondering the second parable, I realized why I was there. Because I must be numbered among the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And when I heard blind, it suddenly occurred to me, why is it sometimes long? Why is it sometimes boring? Why is it that I say the angels and the saints all surround us and our songs and our prayers and our sacrifice are one and the same? Heaven and earth are united, and yet I am oblivious. Why? Because I am blind. Why can't I stay? Why can't I go from here to there and just stay in heaven? for the rest of Sunday and the rest of my life because I'm lame. And so as I see the third parable, and I realize that the king has thrown this marriage feast for his son, and all kinds of excuses later, he's invited precisely those who know themselves to be poor and blind and lame. Suddenly, I knew why I was where I was and why sometimes I'm bored, and why always God my Father is patient and merciful in accommodating himself to us and our weaknesses, because far better than we know it, he knows we're poor and lame and blind and maimed. And what a glorious thing it is to recognize, on the one hand, through the eyes of faith, we are surrounded by the angels and the saints. We have been invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb, we don't have to die to go to heaven as Catholics. We just go to Mass, and heaven is where we are. And yet, unworthy servants are what we are. We're not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word, and my servant, which is my soul, which is sick, will be healed. And so the next time you feel a little bit bored, the next time your mind wanders at Mass, realize that God isn't up there ready to zap you. God as a father is tending to your needs as a beloved yet blind daughter or son. Someone who knows our lameness better than we do and someone who loves us and wants to forgive us more than we want him to. And this and this alone is what will get us home. This and this alone is what will make us saints. This and this alone is what will empower us to overcome temptation. And I want to conclude by referring to one of my favorite texts in 1 Corinthians, where Paul is talking all about the Eucharist in chapters 10 and 11. Because I want to conclude on a semi-practical note. And by the way, it helped a little with my five-and-a-half-year-old. I went home, and at lunch I'm like, Hannah, let me explain that though we're in heaven, we still have earthly bodies and we're physically blind to what we know is spiritually there. And she's like, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> now, God be praised, she's engaged to a convert, you know, who's finishing a PhD at the Medieval Institute who absolutely loves this liturgy like she does and we have conversations about it all the time. You gotta be patient with sons and daughters, just like God is with me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says something very profound and practical. Therefore, in verse 12, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. 
We know that phrase because it's paraphrased. We, we say pride goeth before a fall. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. If you think you're rich, look again, you're poor. If you think you're strong, look again, you're lame. If you think you've got 20-20 vision, look at the Eucharist and tell me what appears to be there. We're all sharing this kind of physical blindness in our natures. But then Paul goes on to say in verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. In other words, don't think you're terminally unique in the problems you face. A lot of other people have the same or worse. That's helpful, but that's not enough. So Paul goes on to say, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. And that is helpful, that's consolation. So you're not gonna face any trial. That's just a better translation of parosmos than temptation. You're not gonna face any trial or temptation that is unique. Others have faced it. Plus, God will give you the grace to withstand the temptation, to endure. And then, in almost every English translation, there's a paragraph break. In mine, there's actually a new subheading. And it looks like Paul's changing the subject, except the next verse begins in verse 14, therefore, my beloved. But that's not how you begin a new subject, that's how you draw a conclusion. And Paul's a logical thinker. Whenever you see him using therefore, ask what it's there for because he's about to draw an important conclusion. Therefore, my beloved, I'm speaking as to sensible men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation, a koinonia in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? You know, and the Corinthian readers, just like modern readers, might have been looking and say, well, yeah, okay, the cup of blessing which we bless, it's a communion in the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, yeah, it's a, it's a communion in the body of Christ. But what's your point? I mean, you kind of zig where we thought you'd zag. You were talking about how God will always provide a way of escape so that you can endure whatever trials and temptations come your way. And then you seemingly change subjects, or did he? When we are tempted, you know, I was on the turnpike a couple of weeks ago and everybody was just really speeding. I mean, it's 65, they were going 75, I was too. And I saw this clearing, you know, about a mile and a half straight away, just thinking, I can go 80, I gotta get there. And as I was about to give into the temptation, I saw the cop before he saw me. Is that, is, do you think that's what Paul's talking about? That he provides the way of escape. I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. What is he talking about? What is the way of escape that he provides so that we can endure whatever trials come our way? The very next verse. Therefore, I'm speaking as to sensible men, judge for yourselves what I say, the cup of blessing which we bless. It's the Eucharist. It's the Eucharist that Jesus instituted to make his life a gift of love, not a life that was lost on Friday, but a life that was given on Thursday. And to prove that his body was given up, to prove that his blood would be poured out, he endured the agony of Good Friday, but only to prove that this was more than rhetoric. This was more than ritual. The reality of his love is life-giving. And he gives it to us because of Easter Sunday, we have the resurrected body of Christ so that in our own mortal bodies, we can endure trials and face temptations and not give in to our own weakness, not give in to our own lust, our temper, our own willfulness and pride. We can take that love and transform our suffering into a holy sacrifice. We can experience Holy Thursday and Good Friday and anticipate Easter Sunday. You know, I, I taught the last six years at St. Vincent's on Monday. I love teaching future priests all about the Bible. You know, and it was really fun to get to know the Benedictines there. Archbishop Douglas was the one who tapped me to kind of teach scripture. His predecessor was named, can you believe this, Archbishop Egbert. I never met him, but I met all these Benedictines who loved him and who shared the memory because he was greatly beloved, but he was guilty of a lot of rhetorical infractions malapropisms. I mean, he would often misspeak on grand public occasions and just innocently not notice 
And I talked to one who was the unofficial archivist. He told me 30 or 40 occasions as the archabbot. I mean, that's like an archbishop over an archdiocese. This is an archabbey in Latrobe. But of all the stories I got to hear, one of them was my favorite because they're in the Basilica at St. Vincent's with a place that was just, it was packed, standing room only, with all of these dignitaries surrounding him, archbishops and cardinals and bishops. He said at the very end, without noticing a thing, this ass is mended, let us go in peace. <laughs> and overheard through the microphone was an archbishop who leaned over and said, truer words were never spoken. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, we go to heaven every time we go to Mass, whether we know it or not. It's time for us to know it, but it's also time for us to discover, in the context of a heavenly liturgy, our own earthly weakness and the need for personal humility, to recognize why our mind wanders at Mass, why it seems long, and why we feel bored, because we're, we're, we're poor, we're blind, we're lame, we're maimed. But God in his infinite richness, gives us not only the cure, but also the way of escape for us to endure whatever trials we face, so that no matter how stubborn or willful we are, and donkeys are often as we, <laughs> we often act like stubborn fools, God reaches down to us in our lowliness and raises us up to his own heavenly glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we are your sons and daughters on earth. Because you are our Father, we know that we're your family. But because you are in heaven, we know that we are pilgrims in exile. No matter what we might call home, we know that heaven is our only one true home. And while we long for it, we also thank you for gathering us together in every Eucharistic liturgy to come home under the appearance of bread and wine to come home under the sacraments, through them. We ask you, dear Father, in the name of Jesus, for the Holy Spirit to increase our faith, our hope, and above all, our charity, so that no matter what trials we face, we can trust you more than we trust ourselves and overcome them by the blood of Christ and through the bread of life. Help us and hear us as we pray the family prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Francis of Assisi, St. Teresa of Avila, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.